This is my cousin Sam. Sam was born completely paralyzed. He's unable to speak or controllably move because of severe cerebral palsy. He's completely dependent on his parents and caregivers for everything while being fully lucid. I want you to imagine what it might be like to be completely dependent on others, yet to not be able to express yourself and to be unable to interact with the world around you. This is what I was imagining at my first TEDx Auckland some years back. Under the punchy slogan of make shit happen, we, the audience, were asked to complete a sentence. If I ran the world, something, something. When I was done, my answer card read, allow paralyzed children to have equal opportunity in the world. And the second card underneath said, create technology that allows them to speak. At this point, this was a big dream with absolutely zero support for execution. Luckily, just days after that event, I came across a video demonstration of a device that could read the electrical activity of the brain. And with some training, allowed a person to move a box on the screen using their brain activity. Now it seemed like there could be a way to get to that dream. The initial idea went something like this. You take that device or similar technology, to then bypass the limitations of physical disability and directly access what's in the person's mind so they can control a computer and communicate. Plus, there was a bonus, and this might surprise some of you. Everybody has a brain. <laughs> so, if this worked for someone like my cousin Sam, then anybody could also communicate and interact using their mind. In academia and research, this is called brain-computer interfacing. And outside of those, more recently, it's also been referred to as brain-sensing technology. Here is a very quick overview. The basic premise is to observe the activity of the brain and then interpret it into control commands or other inputs for computer systems. These observations can be done either invasively by surgically inserting electrodes into the brain to detect the electrical activity of neurons, the brain cells, or non-invasively using different brain imaging and monitoring techniques. For example, functional MRI that uses huge magnets in room-sized machines to look at changes in blood flow that are associated with brain activity, or electroencephalography, EEG, that looks at the electrical activity of the brain using an array of sensors that is placed on the outside of the scalp. To me, this seemed like an easier option comparing to brain surgery or multi-million dollar MRI scanners, especially if we could get a less conspicuous device. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years, and I and several people much smarter than me started a company called ThoughtWired. At ThoughtWired, we use this kind of technology to create a non-invasive, commercially available brain-computer interface for everyone. The ultimate goal is to have an interface that will enable anyone to intuitively interact with any device using their mind. Last August, years of our research and development culminated in launching our first product, Nows Blink. Now Splink is a wearable that translates eye movement signals into actions while sensing brain activity. A combination of an advanced biosensor and our unique machine learning algorithms allows anyone to control a computer by blinking their eyes. With it, people like Sam can type out text, browse the internet, operate smart home devices, basically do anything that can be done with a click of a button. One of these people is Danielle, a vibrant, creative 27-year-old. Danielle, just like Sam, lives with severe cerebral palsy. Before Now's Blink, she could only communicate yes by looking up and no by looking down. She had tried a number of different types of assistive access and communication technologies, but none worked for her needs. 
During development of NAOS, we spent a year co-designing the system with Danielle and her support network. This process ensured that what we were building suited her needs and the needs of those with similar conditions. Now Danielle uses NAOS on an almost daily basis to play games, communicate, complete puzzles, create artwork, even take sneaky photos of her dad and friends while they're snoozing. <laughs> it is the first time she's been able to independently communicate in her life. Those of you paying attention now may be asking, if you're building a brain interface, why does your first product work using eye blinks? The answer is electricity and practicality. Our bodies produce different kinds of electrical activity. There's brain activity, muscle activations, even eye movements have their own signals. And all of these can be detected using sensors. Let me demonstrate. Excellent, I did bring my brain, perfect. <laughs> the headband that I'm wearing is actually a biosensor. It is manufactured by our partner and it is the part of the NOW system. On the screen, you can see the signals that the sensor is picking up from my forehead. It is the combination of my brain activity, eye movements, and muscle activations. This bar chart is the breakdown of that activity into frequency bands, and each band correlates to certain types of brain activity and states, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. And if you look at the line graph, you will see spikes. There you go, like that. That is me blinking my eyes. During our work on translating brain activity into computer controls, we also created technology that can detect these eye blinks and more importantly, differentiate between the natural automatic blinks and the intentional purposeful ones. We take the signal data and transform it into commands for controlling computers. This de blink detection capability was ready to be shipped before anything else that we've built, and so we put it to use for people like Danielle. Meaningful outcomes for users are far more important than how capable or cool your technology is. NOW's blink systems have already been deployed in eight countries around the world with individuals like Danielle and organizations that work with people with disabilities. And as we speak, finally, my cousin Sam and his parents are learning how to use their own NAUS Blink system. But NAUS Blink is just the first step. Connecting the brain and computers is a very hard problem. You need large amounts of dynamic brain data captured outside of controlled environments like research labs. So everything that our team is learning and the signal data that our technology is accumulating from NOWS Blink users is feeding into our ongoing development process of that ultimate brain interface. As we work towards that vision, we are guided by the principle that if you start designing with people who have very specific, urgent needs, then you are likely to solve problems for much larger populations in the long run. Some of the technologies and products that are used by billions today were originally designed to address very specific challenges. The typewriter was initially used by people who were blind to write letters, and Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone to help his work supporting people who were deaf. When we empathize with others, we create things that otherwise we might have never created ourselves. We see past the specifics of what we know to create experiences that can actually be universal. By following this process, we created a solution that is already changing people's lives. And obviously, we're not done. There are thousands of people like Sam and Danielle who need our system. So our immediate focus is to make sure it gets out to them. But at the same time, we're already thinking how we can help even larger populations of people. We're considering a number of applications in areas like cognitive assessments, therapy, and sleep. Cognitive assessments rely on ability to communicate, which people who need those assessments often lag due to trauma or disability. 
Today, mental health professionals rely on subjective surveys and observations to assess whether their interventions are working. These methods are notoriously biased, uninformative, and inaccurate. And in sleep health, people with chronic disorders have to go to sleep labs to be wired up to uncomfortable devices to be diagnosed and treated. With the type of wearable sensors and machine learning algorithms that we use, it is possible to observe levels of attention, stress, cognitive load, and many others. We can do that by analyzing the composition of brain signals, those different frequency bands that I showed earlier. And we already have the technological foundation to do that. By building on it, we will be able to provide accurate measures of emotional state and cognitive function, real-time feedback on interventions, and progress to recovery or improvement. I'm especially excited by the combination of the work that we've already completed with these new directions. It will unlock access to treatments and services for people with severe disabilities who struggle to communicate among all of the other users. This talk started with imagining and dreaming, so let's wrap it up in a similar way. Imagine having your smart device tell you, hey, you seem to be quite stressed and your attention isn't so great at the moment. So maybe let's take a break, go for a walk, and then you can come back to this important piece of work that you need to finish. We can do this by analyzing those same kinds of brain data that we have to analyze for therapeutic outcomes. We will be able to anticipate and predict users' mental states, similarly to how Google Maps at the moment suggests different destinations based on your history. Then there are specific responses in the brain that we observe or experience. For example, it's been demonstrated that detected can be distinct signals in brain why error is observed. Most of you just produce those signals, while I did my best to keep the sentence distorted for you. Basically, our brains spot errors in language within milliseconds of observation. You could see how plugging this into a this detection into a smart device could eliminate the need to ever press backspace again. From there, we enter the territory of superpowers. Researchers around the world have been achieving incredible results, extracting speech and images from brain activity, letting people control exoskeletons and robotic prosthetics using their mind, even proving that technological telepathy, brain-to-brain -brain communication, is possible. These examples are strictly lab results, uh, in most cases achieved with surgically implanted electrodes. This means that, unfortunately, none of us are going to be getting a mind-controlled exoskeleton for this Christmas or that we'll be telling campfire stories telepathically during the holidays. But it gives us a glimpse of scientifically proven possibility. And it is our job to now turn these possibilities into reality. We have a working platform to get us there and key principles to guide us. Remember to start with practicality before coolness of technology. Think of the non-average users because the average doesn't exist. And design with people and not for people. Imagine a future where technology understands and anticipates your needs and helps you live healthier, more fulfilling life. Imagine a world that is universally accessible to everyone at the speed of thought. This is the world that I and our team are building, and we want to empower not just people like my cousin Sam or even me and you, but everyone to live healthier, happier lives full of independence, possibility, and superpowers. Thank you.